Good morning and happy Sunday. It's wonderful to see everyone this morning. As we get ready to begin our worship service, I did have just one quick thing I wanted to make sure I made note of. You may have already noticed, but on the altar rail are the boxes for Operation Christmas Child. Believe it or not, it is that time. Um, Christmas time will be here before we know it, and we are thankful that it, we get a chance again this year to participate in that. If you would like a box to pack, you can get one from the altar. There are ones throughout the um, the church as well, and if we run out, don't worry, we have more. Inside are the instructions, depending on what age group you want to pack for, boy or girl, things like that. Um, how to pack it, where to have it, and when should all be in your box. If you have any questions, feel free to contact Miss Nancy Petrus, or you can call the church office either way. But just make sure if that's something you want to participate in, that you go ahead and get started, because the time to turn them in will be here before we know it. Are there any other announcements, joys, concerns this morning? Then if you will take just a moment and reflect on how wonderful the light of Christ is, my friend Catherine is going to bring it into the church today. this morning who among you is seeking the wisdom of God we long to hear God's spoken to our hearts who among you is seeking God's bright and holy truth we long to learn the ways of wisdom and righteousness who among you is seeking a spirit filled life we long to live lives of holiness and light God grants God's wisdom generously to all who ask. Come near, people of God. Let us worship in wisdom and truth. Well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it beautiful outside? What a nice fall morning. We're going to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's raise our voices together.
Hold on, now am I on? I can't ever tell, gosh. Fall break, ball game, pretty weather, so thank you. And for those of you online, thank you for joining us this morning as well. I'm thankful that you chose to come and be with us today. Um, we're going to start our morning off with a prayer. So if you could join me in prayer this morning. Almighty God, we come to you today ready to hear your words, ready to hear your wisdom for our lives. So Lord, let us lean into this time of worship. Let us lift your name in high holy praise. Let us speak and sing and worship in such a way that it just shoots out these walls out into the community, that your name is glorified in all spaces and places. We're a body of Christ, whether we're visiting or we live here or we're just sometimes here, sometimes not. We're together right now, and that makes us the body with Jesus at the head. So as all bodies, we have one voice, one spirit. Let us now pray with that one voice the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I 
light in the darkness, my God, that is who you you're working even when I don't feel that you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop church and because he is our way maker we can say with confidence that it is well let's sing it is well with my soul
They say the only thing that ever stays the same is that things change. So here we are. <laughs> um, I was never content with the way that we were handling not passing the collection plate. And for me, it wasn't a money thing as much as it was, it just didn't feel sacred. It just felt like, okay, so here's where you would have given, but we're not given, so here we go. So we, we've changed, and if you will look, if you are the person sitting on the inside, there's a basket next to you, a gray basket, that's your offering basket. So if the person sitting on the inside will get the basket and put it in your hand, and then while Marcus plays an offertory, you guys can pass it down the row and get what you need and pass it back or lean or whatever you want. And then when we sing the doxology, the person on the inside can stand and hold it up. And then you can just put it back in the seat. Okay? So, Marcus? have the basket, hold the basket. either under the pew or beside you. We have a choir.
I'll be reading Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Hang on a second. You got to get a mic. Now you can go. Check, check. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. James 3, 13 through 17. <laughs> Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. 1 Kings 3, 3 through 9. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to his instructions given him by his father David. It said that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices that, for that was the most important high place. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask whatever you want, Ask whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown me great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on 
his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in my place of, of my father David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry on my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give me, your servant, a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. But who is able to govern this great people of yours? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Steve.
thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you, Dawn. That was amazing. That was beautiful. Jennifer. Will you pray with me and for me, please? Almighty God, we come to you today ready to hear your wisdom. I pray that any words that come through on this message that are not meant for us today, that they just fall on deaf ears. But I also pray that our hearts are fertile and ready to absorb your wisdom. May they plant seeds in our hearts that grow through the week and help us to lean more into your understanding. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So I want to tell you a story about a guy named Saul. Um, I think he went by Solomon, but we're going to call him Saul for a minute. Now, you've heard of King David. King David was the king that was a man after God's own heart. Now, that didn't mean he was perfect. In fact, he did a lot of things that he probably should not ought to have done. Um, as my grandson would say, he better don't do that. So he did some things that he should not do. He, he um, did a lot of things that were great. He was a, a, an amazing warrior. And he fought for God's kingdom like none other. And he fought off the enemies of God. And he was chased by disreputable people. But he held true to his faithfulness to God. But sometimes he let his own ways and his own desires and his own wants get in the way of what God wanted for him. And he, he saw a woman on a roof. And he laid with her. And he made a child that was taken from him. But his second child with Bathsheba, he named Solomon. And what God wants from us is what David did. He learned from his missteps the first time. And he did a very good job with Solomon teaching him the ways of the Lord, teaching him what God requires, teaching him what God needed from him. So much so that at the ripe old age of 15, 15, he had Solomon ascend to the throne. Now, can, first of all, can you imagine being the one chosen to follow King David? But then being the one chosen to follow King David at the age of 15. And you're in charge of the entire kingdom of Israel. And trust me, those people were not easy to lead. They were rebellious. They were sometimes a little whiny. Um, they wanted their own way. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to do what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. And they didn't like anyone telling them what to do. Sounds a lot like me. Um, I don't know if it resonates with you in any way, but possibly. But that's what Solomon was handed at 15. So Solomon did what probably many of us would do. He panicked. And he went into a place that was not the place where they were called to worship. He did not go to Gibeon at first. He went and he just kept offering sacrifices and burning, almost in like a frenzy. Placing offerings, burning them. He wasn't remembering what David had told him to do until finally he got desperate. And he went to Gibeon and he did as he was told and he cried out to the Lord, I need you, God. He would finally backed himself into a corner and he did what we know to do and he cried out to God and God said, what do you need from me, Solomon? And Solomon could have prayed for power, which, trust me, with the Israelites might not have been a bad thing to ask for. He could have prayed for the same warrior military acumen his dad had. He could have prayed for political savviness. He could have prayed for a lot of things. But you know what he prayed for? Wisdom. He asked for God to help him have the same wisdom as God. Now, he didn't want to be as smart as God. He just wanted to make decisions as God would have him. And apparently it worked because there's even a story in the Bible where two women were fighting over a baby. One of the women's baby had died, and so she wanted the other woman's baby. And they, they were married to the same man, 
and that was a thing. If you didn't know that, that was a thing. Um, so they went to King Solomon to settle the dispute. And with the wisdom of God, King Solomon said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get the baby in half, and then you each have half a baby. Sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? But this is what he knew because he had this wisdom within him. He knew that the true mother of that child would never let harm come to her child. And she would step up, and she would prevent that from happening, even if it meant losing her child. And that's exactly what happened. And then Solomon knew who the rightful mother was of that child. You see that wisdom of God. Wisdom or understanding is only as effective as when it's put into action. Say that again. Wisdom or understanding is only as effective when it is put into action. So when he used that wisdom that God gave him in that answered prayer, he was always glorifying God. But when he thought on his own and did his own thing, it didn't go so well. So Saul was so wise and so smart and had leaned on God so much, he wrote three parts of our Bible, three books of our Bible. He wrote Ecclesiastes. I don't know if you've ever read it. Um, it's a little tough and snoozy. But there's some good stuff in there. And it's really just reflection on his life. I mean, you'll see in there where he made mistakes. You'll see in there where he learned from those mistakes as he got older, because hopefully that's what we all do. He also wrote Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, depending on your version of the Bible. It's, it's kind of an erotic tale. Of a, of a man and a woman who are in love and, and, and then, but she's not really committed and she's a little adulterous and it's a little sad, but it metaphorically portrays, it metaphorically portrays Israel's lack of commitment and flirtatiousness with God in and out and back and forth. But the book that Solomon wrote that I find the most insight from is, is his collection of words for life, Proverbs, which is where we got our first verse today. And Proverbs tells us what he learned, what he knows, and he wanted to pass that on. So Mia, if you could put up that Proverbs 3 verse, this verse is the verse that's going to guide us through the series for the next four weeks. And so I'm going to ask you to read it with me right now. We're going to say it together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Now, I don't know about you, but I could use some straight paths right now. I feel like the world's a little chaotic. I feel like my life is pulled in so many different directions. And I can't even blame it all on COVID. I mean, I think everybody's just settling into this strange, weird routine. I mean, we've lived in Tennessee 21 years, something like that, 22. I don't remember Tennessee fans ever throwing things on the field. Sorry, Oklahoma people, because that's where I'm from. That sounds like an OU fan to me. I have never seen anything like the such we saw last night. It's almost like we're so caught up in I want to do what I want to do, and if I don't get to do or if I don't like what I'm seeing, I'm going to throw a toddler fit. And that's what I'm seeing, and it's this place where there's a word for that. It starts with an R. Besides rude, it's called rebellion. And it's within our DNA, the people of Israel, that was their problem, the people of everywhere. It's our problem. It's, it's something that's deep-seated within us. It's that place that makes us do what we want to do without thinking about how it's going to look, how it's going to feel, if God would be happy, if we would glorify God, if it's going to be productive. That's always my thing. Is it, does it move forward a wonderful thing or not? Or does it hinder us? Do your actions do that? So we're going to study that for the next four weeks about leaning into the understanding of God instead of leaning into our own understanding. So maybe we can get to a place where our paths are a little more made straight. So I'm a question girl. 
I believe God can handle our questions. I believe God can handle the hard questions. I believe God doesn't tell us, no, you should not question. Now, I grew up in a faith tradition where if you ask questions, you didn't have faith. That you should just have blind faith and you should believe anything any Sunday school teacher ever told you or any pastor ever told you. And if you questioned it at all, that wasn't okay and I disagree. Because I'm a firm believer that if you're asking questions to God, you're seeking answers. And if you're seeking answers, you will gain wisdom. And if you gain wisdom, you begin to have that understanding that Solomon told us that we needed to have. But if we just sit and take at face value anything anyone tells us, then sometimes they might have told Yes, preachers can be wrong. Sunday school teachers can be wrong. They could be leaning on their own understanding. So we're going to ask some questions. And here's some questions I have. How do you gain this understanding? I mean, like, how do you even get it? How do you get it? And how can we be certain... We gained the right understanding. As a pastor, I ask that question every day because my job is to help you gain understanding. And if I don't have right understanding, then I'm going to lead you down a wrong path. So it's a constant question I have for myself, and it's one that I would beg you to have for yourselves. And how do we practice this understanding? Because remember I told you wisdom and understanding is only as effective as when you put it into action. So how do we do that? How do we put knowledge into action? And is God's way or understanding even relevant today? I mean, Solomon said this like 3,000 plus years ago. So is it even relevant in 2021? I mean, is there anything in there that can guide us or lead us? So let's go back to that first question about how do we gain the understanding. Saul wanted it, and he got it. But he didn't always heed it. You need to know that. Saul got this wonderful wisdom, but he wasn't perfect. In fact, he ended up marrying, like, a bunch of wives, like more than you can count. And he didn't do it because he was madly in love with them or attracted to them or wanted to be in a committed union with them or wanted a whole bunch of children. He married them for political purposes. He married them because in his mind he started thinking, ooh, I need to get along with this country because if I get along with this country, then I will have it an easier job. And if I get along with this country, I'll have an easier Now, whose understanding is he in in that moment? Not God's. And so he married a lot of wives that probably were not the best choice for him, and most of them did not follow nor believe in God. And he allowed those wives to affect how he lived his life. They pulled him down a wrong path. I had a, a pastor one time tell me that, um, and if we had more time and I could get anybody up here to do it, but this is where the kids leaving is not good. But if you, someone is laying on the floor, it is easier for them to pull me down than it is for me to pull them up. That's what happened with Solomon and his wives. They began in places to pull him down, pull him away from God, pull him in a place that was not good for the kingdom nor the king. So why are this way we can get understanding? Well, first of all, the way Solomon got it, for sure, praying. But prayer is critical that you listen and hear and absorb, not just talk. I've told you this before, and it's kind of cliche, but it's true. That's why God gave us two ears, one mouth. And so we listen more than we talk to God and maybe even others. Also, the Bible. But now I want to talk a little bit about the Bible. I love the Bible. But we are not created to worship the Bible. The Bible is not something we should lift above God or lift above Christ. But it is a great tool. It's a, it's, it's a library of 66 books. A library of 66 books all written by a lot of different authors for a certain purpose in a certain time in a certain place for a certain reason. But we can gain wisdom from Scripture. Because the people who wrote it were gaining knowledge from God. They were gaining understanding from God. 
But we have to not read it as if we're there. We have to read it as if we are gaining information from it. Also, you need to do the things that God tells us to do. Or more importantly, God's Son who was sent to show us what to do. And, and to live the way God taught us to live through Christ. And then we have to be. We have to be the person that God is calling us to be. Not something that we decide to do when we're here or we're in a certain place, but all the time, all the places, everywhere we are. Now that question about how can we be certain we gain the right understanding? Because I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. You can read some things in Bible that the Bible that do not line up with what we believe today from God. And if you don't believe me, and I can show you, there's a place in there where God gives instructions for aborting a baby, and we don't want, so trust me. You've got to be careful what you read, and you've got to read it in the context. So how can we be sure? Well, first of all, read the Gospels. Do you read the Gospels, or do you read the parts you like? Now, reading Gospels are challenging, and I'm going to challenge you to read the Gospels. I don't care if you pick Mark or Matthew or Luke or John. Mark's the cliff note version. It gets you the most, you know, the, the guts. Matthew is speaking to a Jewish audience, so it's a little theological. Um, Luke gives you all the details. And then John, John is very theological. But any of those will teach you the character of God through the life of Christ and what he calls you to do and how he calls you to live. It's, it's kind of simple, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But it, it literally gives us a blueprint for how to live our life. I know that that is cheesy and I know that's, do y'all know what Jesus would do? It's another acronym, H-W-L-F. What does that stand for? He would love first, always, and every single time. He doesn't walk up anybody and go, you're wrong, live better, oh yeah, I love you. He doesn't walk up to people and go, I would love you, but you're kind of not a great person. He loves first. And that is why it's critical that we read the Gospels because when we don't read the Gospels, we tend to start leaning into our own understanding and then we start doing what we want to do. And then once we start doing what we want to do, what's the word for that? Rebellion. Rebellion. Now, how do we practice this understanding? Okay, so I like used to be a dancer, believe it or not. I was a ballet dancer on point shoes, the toe shoes in front of the mirror. And I, went, I danced like 12 hours a week. And my feet and knees are very representative of that dancing career. But there was one part of dance class I absolutely hated. We danced in front of a mirror, and I didn't mind that because it helped you make sure you were doing the right thing and that you were doing what everyone else was doing. What I hated was we always had to dance with the face that the dance was going to need to have when we performed it. So if it was an emotive dance, I had to be emotive. If it was a happy dance, we had to be smiley. If it was a sad dance, we had to be sad. And I never could understand why I needed to do that during practice. It made no sense. I also coached basketball. For four years, I coached junior high basketball. We were a winning team. Thank you very much. But it used to aggravate me when I would watch NBA. And I had middle school boys and girls who had better free throw averages than million dollar contract basketball players. Never could understand. Now I know why. And the answer to the dancing with the right face and the free throw average is this. Muscle memory. Middle school boys and girls love to do nothing but free throws. They don't want to run plays, they don't want to do drills, and they don't want to work out in condition, but they love to throw free throws. And that's why they're good. Because their bodies have learned how high I have to jump, how high I have to extend my arms, where I need to stand, how I need to stand, how I need to hold my mouth when I release the ball, and they can make free throws. Those million dollar players get distracted from that. 
That's why we had to dance with the right face, because if we danced with the right face in practice, when we got in front of lights and an audience and loud music and distractions, the face would be there because of muscle memory. That's how you practice this understanding that God gives you. You do it. You do it all the time. You do it when no one's looking. You look for excuses to do it. So what that means is, if someone moves into your neighborhood that's weird, and you don't really know how to, to resonate with them, what would Jesus do? He would go over and introduce himself and say, hey, how are you doing? It's nice to meet you. You do that. If someone at work is irritating you, you don't tell them you're irritating me. You do what Jesus would do. You love them beyond that. There are so many ways we can practice the muscle memory of loving like Jesus every single day, all day, even when people aren't looking. I've got a challenge for you. The, the first service missed out on this. I hope some of them are watching because some of them do. I had a friend that once told me that she never said anything bad about anybody, but she just kept those thoughts inside her head till one day she realized that that was damaging too. So instead of having those thoughts inside her head, she started always thinking nice things about people and never thinking the bad things. Here's your challenge for the day. I don't know if I can do it, but I'm gonna try. Is God's way or understanding relevant to today? That's the big question. Well, I want my path straight. I'm tired of walking a wonky, curvy, crazy, chaotic path. I want people to start thinking about others and quit thinking about what they want. I want me to start thinking about others and quit thinking about what I want. I want to actually find a peace. So we just finished a Bible study, my group that studies on Thursday and some on Wednesday, and we studied a guy named James. If you haven't ever read the book of James, I recommend it. But first put on your steel-toed shoes and your big girl panties because he's tough. And he cuts no slack and he tells it just like it is. You want to know why? James is Jesus' brother. His half-brother, they have different dads, obviously. Jesus has God. James has Joseph. But here's the thing about James. James didn't know who Jesus was till after his death and resurrection. Can you imagine growing up in the same house with Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the Hebrews, and your mom and dad know and nobody tells you. And even if they told you, you don't believe it. You're not on board with this. And James is like the middle child because there's another brother, Jude. So he's like Jan and the Brady Bunch. He's kind of got the perfect older brother and the cute younger brother, and there he is in the middle. So he probably had a big chip on his shoulder. I don't know. But the thing about James was somewhere between resurrection and Pentecost, it clicked for him. And he got it. And once he got it, you know what? He was on fire, and he was panicked that the world would not get it before they died, and he didn't want them to do what he did. He didn't want them to miss the boat. So he doesn't cut anybody any slack, and he goes around and he reteaches Jesus' teachings without kindness and gentleness. Can you put that verse back up, the James? But I, I'm proud of my class. They made it through the entire book of James. No feet replacement needed who is wise and understanding among you let them show by their good life by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom but if you harbor bitter in envy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast about it or deny the truth such wisdom he will even get quotes there such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly unspiritual un and demonic. He does not cut any slack. From where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. 
then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit. In other words, what you're doing is good and pleasing to God, impartial and sincere. He does not cut slack. He tells you exactly if you're living into your own understanding, that is not good. But if you live into the understanding of God, it is fruitful, it is humble, it is spiritual, it is healing, it is joy giving, it is peace giving, it is loving. It is what Jesus would do because he would love first. It's a straight path over a chaotic path. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for that in my world. I told you I was a why person. I probably drove my parents crazy with, well, my parent crazy with why. I was told growing up that you should never ask why, you should never question. But I don't, I don't agree. And I have asked, why can't I be stubborn? Why can't I be selfish and get what I want sometimes? Why can't I have it the way I want it? Because for me, I want it a straight path. And when I know that I am striking out on my own and my own way, I do not always end up where I need to be. I often end up being exactly where I don't need to be. But when I lean into the love of God and the love of Jesus Christ and the teachings within the gospel, I find myself exactly where I need to be. So for the rest of the series, you will be hearing from the wisdom of Saul and the teachings of James. Be prepared. And we will find out what God's understanding is for us in a few spaces of our life. This could be a whole year-long sermon, but it's, I mean, series, but it's not going to be. We're just going to touch on a few things. But I pray that you begin to lean in and trust the understanding of God. Because wisdom and understanding is only as effective when you put it into action. And I have a challenge for you. And here's your challenge. First of all, start reading the Gospels. If you haven't read them in a while, start now. Find out what Jesus is all about. If all you think of Jesus is the cute little baby in the manger and the guy that died so you will live, you're missing out on the biggest, richest part of why God sent him to this world. Are you ready for peace? Then take this challenge. Ask God to look at your life and ask him where this place is you're missing the mark on his understanding. It's a big ask. He'll tell you. And then practice like James would have you practice. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you today ready to lean into your understanding. Because we want a life of wisdom and understanding that is in action in this world. We live in a world craving for you, God. Craving for Jesus Christ. Craving to have a straight path. Let us begin to walk that path. Amen. Marcus is going to play something. And while he plays, the uh, we've missed you playing, by the way, sir. The altar is open. And you are welcome to come down. Just distance yourself appropriately. If you need prayer, let me know. I'll be happy to pray with you. Otherwise, just stay in your seat and meditate on what you've heard. And maybe God will speak to you what what that challenge needs to be for you.
told you this before, but I want to tell you again, we don't do this just for pomp and circumstance or to uh, give small children fire. We, <laughs> although that's always kind of fun and adds excitement to the day. Um, we do this for a reason. The purpose of this is that this light of Christ that burns as we hear the words of God and sing the words of God and speak the words of God, this light goes out into the world. And so as you leave, take all that you've gained during this time with you and put it into action into the world. If you just leave it on the pew as you leave, you've gained nothing. So as she walks by, let this remind you of what has been ignited in you during this time. And just as she takes the light out into the world, take it with you. Let Catherine get ahead of you, and then you may take your light out as well. Have a blessed and holy week. Sorry. No, <laughs> because I didn't know. <laughs> but sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you're here. So tell me names. Sarah. Sarah. Rocky. Rocky. That's right. Is, is uh, Joe at work? Yeah. Well, he had to go in at like 10 or 11. Typically, he's here. Yeah. He's going to be so sad. That he did not see you. Did you see Mia? Yes. Did you talk to Mia? Okay. How's yeah, I was I How's like, Faith doing? She's good. She's yeah. in Florida with uh, the bushes. Okay. Yeah. He usually runs the camera. Yeah. And um, but and he usually doesn't get scheduled on Sunday until yeah. like one. Later. So it was really weird. But his schedule has been changing like. On the daily.